I will begin by giving a brief definition of the term uh, contentment. I mean, what it means in its original Sanskrit equivalent. But in Sanskrit, the word used is samtosha. Santosha literally means a state of mind where you don't really seek for anything higher. You reach a level of, uh, I don't want to use the word satisfaction because that is too gross, too inadequate a word to express the real implication of the word contentment. Well, when you reach a state of inner fulfillment, an inner completeness, inner perfection, where you do not feel a need for striving for anything, anything else. Now, if you buy a car, a car that you want, that you like, you may feel a kind of inner satisfaction, but not contentment. Not what contentment means in its original Sanskrit equivalent in Santos. Because the reason is that car may break down maybe after a few years it could be stolen. And then this satisfaction or happiness that you enjoy when you buy the car is lost. It becomes unhappiness. So it's just like two sides of the same coin. On one side you have happiness when you get something that you want, you like. But that happiness is an integral part of its opposite, unhappiness. So you can't have a coin with only one side. If you want a coin, you should have two sides. Now can you think of a coin with only one side? Well, logically you can't think of it. But if you can think of it, that is content. So that's a real meaning of the word contentment. So it's a kind of inner spiritual feeling of fulfillment uh, that goes beyond uh, satisfaction. That's why uh, Lord Krishna gives a very wonderful philosophically and psychologically very rational interpretation of the word contentment. Sukham Atindigam Yetat Buddhigrahim Atindriya. So the word used is Sukham, which literally, if you go to Nodi Williams or Apte, you find happiness, joy. But it is qualified by an adjective. Atindigam means the absolute, the complete. I mean, a kind of happiness which doesn't have its opposites. As I said earlier, in the empirical world, in the world of the senses, happiness is not really happiness. It is only the absence of unhappiness. So you are unhappy because you couldn't buy a BMW, you had only a Toyota or nothing. Now you get a BMW, then the unhappiness associated with not having a BMW vanishes. So, the joy associated with a new expensive car is only an absence of the unhappiness of not having it. So, real, ha real happiness is impossible to achieve at the sensory level. That's what it really means. Because happiness at the empirical level is not happiness, it is only the absence of unhappiness. Now, so Lord Krishna says, Atyantika means absolute. It doesn't have its opposite. It is like a coin with only one side. And then he says, Buddhigrahim Atyantriya. You know, there is a reason why I quote this verse, because uh, contentment is a spiritual state of human mind. It is not related to this world of empirical experiences. So, Lord Krishna uses Atyantika means absolute, infinite. And he says it is beyond the experience, beyond cognition of the five senses or human or intelligence. He cannot intellectually, mentally 
experience will analyze it. So, Sukham Atyendigam Yatat Buddhi Brahim Atyendriya. That's what Lord Krishna says. This is supposed to be the most perfect and complete definition of what Santosha or contentment literally means in actual experience. There is another term used which comes very close to this but not exactly equal to this. That is Padanjali Yoga system where uh, this uh, contentment is listed as one of the secondary uh, disciplines. Niyama it is called. Shaucha Santosha Tapaswadhyay Isarpanithana. So Santosha is also is a kind of um, natural discipline that every person should uh, cultivate along with other nine disciplines, yamas and niyamas. Now, this is the real meaning of contentment. Now, you can, I can give the picture of a person who has this contentment and uh, a person who doesn't have it. You may be driving in the freeway. Now, and you are caught in a traffic jam and you know you are informed by the traffic police that you won't be able to move forward for the next two hours. You are sure about it. Now, you know it very well and you can easily sit on a good seat. Still, you will be sitting in the car feeling anxious. Your BP goes up. If you are a diabetic patient, it gets aggravated. and um, you know what a terrible uh, state of affairs and then you're complaining, cursing the, tra the traffic system, the police department, the, the highway system, everything. But this, uh, this uh, expression of unhappiness doesn't improve the state of affairs. Anyway, you, have, you can't move after uh, maybe within two hours. Now, the point is, a man or a woman or a person who has reached a level of contentment can sit quiet without being disturbed. Knowing fully well that you can't do anything about it. So one can sit quiet, doing nothing and get anxious, fatigued, tired. It really happens in our life. So a state of contentment is a state of inner fulfillment where you are able to uh, remain in a state of complete tranquility, peace and happiness. Now, to drive home this idea, I can quote another very interesting statement. It comes in one of the one of our important devotion classics, Bhagavata Purana. Nityotsavam bhavatyesham nityasri nityamangala. This is the statement. It's a very profound statement. What is the mental state of an individual who has got contentment. For him, every moment, every day is a day of celebration. That is what literally means. Every day is a celebration. Every day is a holiday. It doesn't mean that you don't work. But you, even while working very, uh, very hard for long hours in the office, you can feel the joy of uh, holiday. Because you are always in a state of inner fulfillment, inner happiness, which is infinite, which is not the, just the absence of unhappiness. This is what contentment literally means. So it is not a psychological, it is not a sensory state of experience, it is a kind of inner experience. Now, as I said, it is a spiritual state of human mind. That's why in the 12th chapter of the Gita, Lord Krishna describes the characteristics of an ideal devotee. You may ask the question, why all this bundle of the old ancient Sanskrit verses? There is a reason for it. Contentment, as I said, is possible only for a true spiritual seeker. It's not possible for anybody. 
If you are an executive, if your performance is not very good, you may attend a kind of session where you pay $100 per hour and you are asked to shout, when I shall succeed, I shall succeed, 10,000. We come home and again the mind goes back to the previous state. So any kind of psychological counseling, any kind of auto-suggestion, all days will not give you contentment because it is a spiritual state of human mind. It is not a psychological, it is not an emotional state of human mind. So Lord Krishna says the first sign that we are spiritual seekers, a person as a spiritual um, uh, uh, inter, a spiritual aspiration is Santushta Satadam Yogi Yatatma Dhanishcheva means a person who has got contentment within, who has got inner contentment, he alone can be a devotee of God. Because being a spiritual aspirant, a seeker itself gives you a kind of inner fulfillment, inner joy. If you read, I mean, some of you may have read St. Teresa of Avila's autobiographical writings. I am giving example from a different cultural uh, source. St. Teresa of Avila was a great woman saint. Her autobiographical writings are very famous, very well known. If you write it, you find, oh no, the devil is tempting me, so I should be careful. So, you find such writings. Now, she or any spiritual seeker in any any spiritual tradition. Or if you read the Way of the Pilgrim, it's a well-known Russian mystical work belonging to mid-19th century. The way, I mean, the Way of the Pilgrim and the Pilgrim continues in journey. Two examples. Now you find these great spiritual seekers, they have to face a lot of obstacles, problems, crises in their life. Now, how are they able to uh, face these problems. Lord Krishna says a true spiritual seeker should be a person of strong determination. I will. So, Sandushta Sadadam Yogi Yatatma Dhrdhanisya. Dhrdhanisya means person has a strong determination. And I will. A weak person cannot be a spiritual seeker. And a weak person will can never, mentally weak person can never have contentment. So, these great spiritual seekers are able to uh, go ahead in their spiritual life. They are able to face problems and obstacles and critical situations. What you call dark night of the soul, a state of mind where you reach, you have re you feel you reach a dead end in your spiritual journey. They are able to confront all these problems because they create they have a fuel that move that enables them to move forward. That is this contentment. Well, I am a spiritual seeker. I am on the right track. So this feeling gives them a tremendous contentment. You know, contentment helps you to conserve your mental, psychological energy. That is one important, very practical benefit of being contented. If you are not contented, if you are unhappy, then a lot of um, emotional, psychological energy will be dissipated, will be de uh, destroyed due to dissipation or distraction. You won't be able to focus your full mind or your full energy on what we are doing. Because be anxious. Anxiety is rooted in discontentment. So, anxiety can be sold only at a spiritual level. So contentment helps us to conserve our energy, preserve our energy, save our energy, mental energy, and also power of concentration. And this helps us to divert our mental energy and power of concentration into a spiritual channel, into whatever we are doing, actually. A calm and contented, peaceful person who is 
who is peaceful within himself and also peaceful with the rest of the world can divert all his energy and time to a creative diversion, to creative direction. Whatever he is doing or she is doing, he can spend full time energy and focus on but the particular but what he is doing at the present. So he will be able to live at the present. Otherwise, our anxiety and discontentment uh, will be dissipated either worrying about the problems from the past and problems from, from the future. Now, as I said earlier, I quoted one verse, Nityotsavam Bhavati Yesha. You will be able to live in a kind of eternal present, in a state of perpetual celebration. That's what it did to so Utsava means celebration. You have this uh, Easter big celebration. Like that. A holiday mood. See, if one can have a holiday mood throughout our life, it doesn't mean not doing work or not going to the office. Even in the midst of uh, engage, being engaged in our day-to-day -day activities and responsibilities, still if one can have a have, can live in a holiday mood, it is what is meant by living in a eternal present. Now what really happens, so I shall try to explain this background, this, this uh, uh, mysterious experience uh, from different angles. So one point you have to remember is, in spiritual life there is neither past nor future. This may appear to be a bit of a paradox. Contradiction in terms. You know. Actually, we can never experience the past. We never experienced the past. Because the past we experienced only in the form of the present. When we really experience the past, it is only as the present. And when we are going to experience the future, it is only in the form of the present. So, the line of demarcation between the past and the present and the present and the future is like a line that you draw on water surface. It is non-existent, it is purely a matter of imagination. Why? Because uh, future is not going to be experienced as future. We are going to experience the future only in the form of the present and the past we experienced only in the form of the present. So past and future are non-existent and they are just matters of imagination. To understand this, we must know, we must keep in mind a picture of our mental world. Padanjali's system of yoga gives a very interesting and very rational interpretation of uh, human mind in its uh, various functions. So it divides the states of human mind based on the emotional health condition <coughs> into five categories. It's called Kshipta, Modha, Vikshipta. Aikagra and Niruta. These are the five Sanskrit terms. If I don't find in Padanjali Yoga Sutras only 195 sutras, you find the commentaries. Vyasa and Vijnana Bhikshu, Ramananda, Saraswati and others. So, the first state of human mind is, is called a Kshipta, means a state of complete restlessness. Maybe a in many conditions, this is associated with many conditions. You, know, you become emotionally, psychologically restless. The second state is a state of stupefaction, where you are not able to understand anything. It's a state of morons or idiots, the terms used in the psychological. The third state is what we are going to discuss. In fact, that is relevant from the standpoint of the spiritual uh, sadhana, spiritual life. That's called Vikshipta. 
which means always in a flux. Like, a, like the pendulum of a clock, which moves from one extreme to the other extreme, one side to the other side. You can, you can find this in our life. Suppose you go to a library, we read a wonderful book, or you go to a church or a temple for prayer and meditation, or you go and attend some wonderful, useful, spiritually very useful programs. So we are interested when we are attending the lectures, when you engage in the prayer in the church or a temple, or when you are reading a holy book, the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible, we feel elated, a kind of <coughs> contentment. And, but after some time, when we go out to our office, our workplace, then mind moves in the opposite direction. So mind doesn't remain in a state of steadiness. This has got one serious problem. You may have noticed it. Suppose we take a decision to meditate, pray. We use our strong determination. When I read this book, I will attend to prayer. After that, you feel, you feel a strong inclination to go and read some newspapers, San Francisco Chronicle of New York Times and read, not the important, some political, social, which may not be very relevant for our life, for spiritual life. So you find the mind has a tendency from one, I mean, at one, at one level to go in search of higher ideas, spiritual ideas, because we have a natural interest in spiritual life, otherwise you won't go for it. But then we don't have the steadiness necessary to remain in that state of higher spiritual containment. So the mind gets tired of doing good things. You know, there is a criminology, there is a problem. Some criminals, they cannot keep themselves in a state of mental steadiness unless they commit some crimes. So there is a particular kind of crimin criminal state of mind. Unless they do some mischief, they won't feel contentment. No contentment, enjoy the sense of meaningfulness of life. So sometimes, in fact, this is characteristic of Vikshipta state. In a very graphic style, the commentators in Padanjali Yoga Sutras give a very wonderful picture of the mental world in a very rational way. So, we have interest in spiritual life, but that interest is not steady. So it is called Vikshipta, which means it's just like uh, the waves in, in the mental ocean. Because the pendulum has to swing in one direction, then it has to swing the opposite direction. It cannot remain steady in the middle. This is characteristic of most of the spiritual seekers. At one stage in our life, we reach a dead end. This is also natural. After practicing long, for long years, meditation, reading of scriptures and so on, many spiritual seekers feel, well, what next? Uh, it, technically, this is called the dark night of the soul in the Christian Catholic mystical tradition where, of course, they give anthropomorphic uh, interpretation to this problem, uh, bringing the devil and the Beelzebub uh, into the picture, you know, Satan into the picture. But Patanjali Yoga system gives a more psychologically rational interpretation. It says, it's a natural characteristic of the human mind, which is trying to achieve spiritual contentment, to feel that it has reached a dead end, it has reached a wall that it cannot penetrate, that it cannot get over. So, at that time, for some time we were lost, but again we may search for spiritual life. This is a big shift of state. The fourth state is Ekagra concentration, and the fifth state is Niruddha, the highest yoga, Chitta Vritti Niruddha. It's 
fifth state. Now, from practical point of view, I want to come back to this this state of vikshipta state, the third state of the human mind. In fact, uh, Arjuna puts one question to Krishna in the Gita, the sixth chapter. And there is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna on this subject. How to achieve contentment? How to remain mentally in a state of perpetual contentment? And how to face the problem of uh, being in a flux always, like a vikshita state in your mind swings from one angle, one extreme point to the other extreme point. So the question is like this: Ayadi Siddhayo Pedu Yoga Chalida Manasaha Aprapi Yoga Samsiddhim Kam Gadim Krishna Gitchani. This is the simple question which naturally comes to any spiritual seeker. The question is this, what about ordinary spiritual seekers who are uh, in a quest for spiritual contentment? We prayed for many years, we meditated for many years, we read holy scriptures, we discussed spiritual matters, and we practiced a lot of discipline, concentration, meditation. But then we don't feel that we are making much progress. So we reach a state of kind of discontentment. Or sometimes, you know, people may not uh, may be faced with an accident, deviation, a fall or death. All these things could happen. All these are included in this question. So the disciple, the Gita, Arjuna puts this question. What is the, what will be the destiny, what will happen to a person who is in search of higher spiritual meaning if he doesn't fully succeed? In answer to this, Krishna uh, expounds a grand philosophy of life. The first he says, the first thing that he says is this, this is the words. I should give an expert meaning. Look here. If you practice meditation only for half an hour in your life, and if you have done only for hundred for hundred years, if you meditate only once half an hour. Or if you have meditated for ninety-nine years then you had a deviation. Supposing you have lived for 100 years. Whatever little, uh, what, however much you have done for your spiritual welfare in this life will never be lost. This is a very psychologically very important answer that Lord Krishna gives. It's not necessarily spiritual practice, but at the subjective level. You have helped a person to cross the streets, a dark, maybe a blind person. Or there is an earthquake or a tsunami in Philippines, you have paid a $1,000 donation you have sent. Or if you could not do anything, you feel at your heart, well, what a, what a tragedy, I couldn't help them. So even an, even an ordinary flash thought, an emotion, or a deed, or a word, whatever little good things we have done in this life, will create a spiritual bank balance, will not be lost, and when you are born again, this bank balance will help you to continue your spiritual journey forward. This is the answer that is given. Now, this is related to two important uh, cardinal principles of Vedanta and Yoga. One is love karma and the other one is the doctrine of rebirth, doctrine of reincarnation. Life is not just one chance. Our life doesn't begin with birth and then long life. And it doesn't end with a piece of stone in the cemetery when the body is pushed through that tube in the crematorium. That's not the end of the journey. 
the journey continues. So, whatever little spiritual practice we live in this world, as we do in this world, either for our own spiritual progress, maybe meditation, japa, reading holy scriptures, or philanthropic activities, or something that we try to do for others in terms of action, thought, word, deed, whatever it may be. This will create a spiritual bank balance. So when you are born again, you can draw your check <laughs> and draw money from the spiritual bank. That's what Lord Krishna actually says. Tatratam buddhisam yogam labhade pavru dehikam yadadecha tato bhuya samsiddhu kurudantara This particular, I mean, I mean, this context, the discussion of this subject ends with this verse. So Lord Krishna says, I'm, we know why, there is a reason why I am explaining this. The clue to developing contentment. In the midst of all the realities and problems you are facing in this 21st century, living in a very competitive world, where you have to, you, you have to exert yourself to the extreme mentally, intellectually, physically, even to keep your life afloat, not only to succeed, to keep the status quo, when you work, when you live in a highly competitive society, uh, it's very difficult to even intellectually conceive of this idea of spiritual contentment. In fact, this verse gives a clue to that. That's why I'm quoting this particular uh, portion for the sixth chapter of the Gita. So Lord Krishna says, as I said, so you remember, you should keep in mind what I said earlier. Whatever little spiritual practice we do, or philanthropic activity, or act of kindness, broad-mindedness, nobility, not necessarily action or word, even thought, will create a vritti, a vasana, a samskara, a nishchaya, and a tendency to continue these actions. You can have spiritual bank balance. And when you are born again, we will naturally connect with this earlier characteristics, the spiritual bank balance. Uh, so that's why when you're walking through the street, when we find there's a big letter, big board, meditation center, feel like entering the play, place and sitting there for some time. Uh, you're able to f confront this onslaught of Vedanta and not run away from here. <laughs> because you have inherited, <coughs> accumulated, brought back from brought back from your previous life this baggage of spiritual treasure which helps you to imbibe, to connect yourself again to this spiritual culture. That's been Tatradam Buddhism Yoga. Buddhism Yoga means, you know, your intellect, your mind is full of these samskaras, these impressions you gathered in previous life. So it connects again. So, when there is an opportunity, when you go to a library, you may read a book, you are connecting again to the past samskaras, <coughs> spiritual samskaras. When you talk to people, when you discuss, again you are connecting again. Sometimes the connection may be lost, it doesn't remain steady, that's the problem. Of course, there is a big shift of mind, mind moving like a pendulum in both directions. So our purpose should be to keep ourselves uh, connected, permanently connected, linked to this higher spiritual ideal. And then we will be able to in, have, enjoy contentment. So that is the real psychological implication of contentment. That means one, should, one can never be unhappy if you feel that whatever you have done, that remains there. You, nothing is lost and you are never late. Even if you are 100 years old, you have only not many years to live, you can start. So, this Vedanta, Vedanta psychology tells you that we can open a new chapter in our life, turn a new leaf in the book of our life, any day, any moment. <coughs> That's what Lord Krishna says. So, this idea of 
doctrine of law of karma and the doctrine of continued existence I mean the idea that life doesn't end with death death is only a colon or a semicolon sorry it is a, a colon semicolon or maybe a comma but not a full stop <laughs> that's what Vedanta tells you this is one a psychological clue to developing contentment. So that's a inf very important principle because it is something that you don't find in modern Christianity, in any of the Abrahamic religions do, according to uh, many theologians, uh, even the early church fathers, the desert fathers, and even even a small tiny sect of Christians who may have come to India in the second century, they still retain this doctrine of uh, rebirth, law of karma and rebirth which uh, the early church fathers, the desert fathers had. But later on, historically speaking, in the fifth century, uh, St. Augustine uh, practically removed it from the Christian theological tradition. And also in 325 AD, there was the Council of Nicaea where the doctrine of law, karma and rebirth were put to vote and it was lost by one vote. And that's the, that's the division of the Eastern Roman Church and Western Roman Church. That, you know, that's the important event in the history of uh, Catholic religion that the, the Council of Nicaea which took place in 325 AD. Of course, these are historical things I'm not going to deal with right now. Unless you are interested, you can ask the question later. So the point is this. The idea that life is a continuous cycle, that death is not the end of the journey, that whatever we little we do will produce its good, useful product, result, which we can enjoy, which will help us to continue our spirit, spiritual journey in next life. This can give us contentment. Because very often, many of the problems, the depression or dissatisfaction, the feeling the dark night of the soul or the life coming to a dead end, when well, we are lost, all these feelings are rooted in one central doctrine. The life is only one chance. At the end of this life, everything is lost. Either you are welcomed to heaven or condemned to hell. That is not the idea of Vedanta and Yoga. That's an important point to keep, keep in mind. So that's one, one important principle you have to keep in mind. Second important principle in developing contentment is this, and that is very crucial in modern times. Our dissatisfaction, depression, or absence of contentment, contentment is rooted in a obsession with pragmatism. We want, people want to judge everything in terms of its tangible, immediately available, practical results. That's an important problem. It stands in the way of cultivating higher contentment. In fact, it's rooted in a way, it is rooted in the old European philosophical school of utilitarianism, which is associated with John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, uh, who defined the validity of any action in terms of maximum amount of pleasure that brings to maximum number of people, which is the philosophy, the doctrine of utilitarianism. So in modern times, you know, we are all living under the tyranny of pragmatism or utilitarianism. We want immediate result, and we want the results that could be judged in terms of dollars, in terms of physical comforts. Whatever we want, to, whatever we do, we want to judge our actions in terms of the immediate practical results that our action produces. So this is one important cause of anxiety and worry. This is the deadliest enemy of contentment. You can easily see. Whatever we learn, 
But is that going to help me to get a better job? Is that going to help me to earn a few more extra dollars? Or is that, is that going to help me to get a higher job? So whatever we learn, do, should have a link to some practical results. And that practical results in the form of physical comforts or to be very frank, the tyranny of dollar. It could be in other countries, tyranny of pound, tyranny of rupees, tyranny of yen, whatever may be. I mean, somehow we want to link whatever we do with its immediate results. If we cannot break the link between what we do and its immediate results, benefits, then we can never have contentment. If we cannot do anything for its own sake, if we cannot do anything without thinking about the practical benefits of our actions, we cannot have contentment. The first step, therefore, to achieve to cultivate contentment, inner contentment is, we must liberate ourselves from the tyranny of pragmatism, of practicality. It doesn't mean that we should take refuge in idealism. Idealism will drive you towards a kind of utopian, imaginary, idealistic world. That's not the purpose. But pragmatism is cut through pragmatism, cut through practicality ideal, will keep us hooked into the world of the senses. It will keep us permanently hooked into today and now the world of comforts. So the first step to a higher contentment is to liberate ourselves from this tyranny of practicality. I mean, the best way to avoid unhappiness is to stop looking for happiness everywhere. Because we can never have happiness 24 hours of the day, 7 days of the week, 365 days of the year. And that's everyone knows. It doesn't require an Einstein or a Shankaracharya or a Ramakrishna Paramahamsa to tell us that there will be unhappiness always. But what happens, you know, in actual practical life, we always look for happiness all the time, every day, every moment. Any well-educated person will be able to intellectually understand the fact that this life is not made of roses. It's not always meant to be comfortable. But that is only as a doctrine. In actual life, we think that we should have comforts, happiness and joy 24 hours of the day, 7 days of the week, 365 days of the year. So long as we are looking for happiness all the time, we are content to live in a world of discontentment. Therefore, the best way to avoid the problem of unhappiness is to recognize the fact that happiness and unhappiness are two sides of the same coin and the only way to go beyond both is to transcend them both. I mean, to stop looking for happiness and then you won't be shocked when you have to face unhappiness. That's the real meaning of Lord Krishna. Atindika means a tra transcendental happiness. If happiness can be transcendental, it is called contentment. Transcendental means like it's like a uh, coin only one side. So, the real contentment stands by itself. The joy, the happiness associated with inner contentment is not just the absence of unhappiness. It is the constant presence of happiness minus its opposite. As I said, you know, it's like a coin with only one side. So, I have just 
touch this subject today. We will discuss tomorrow, continue the discussion tomorrow. So you can have interaction now. We have more than half an hour. And if you have no question to ask, I shall continue. <laughs> right. Maharaj, um, you were just mentioning about uh, step one as stopping to look or uh, look at uh, happiness in every in every object, every moment, yeah. uh, and so on. But uh, in the garb of uh, such an uh, uh, such a process, uh, there is there is a good chance that uh, one might be. Uh, one might cultivate apathy yeah. towards yeah. Uh, everything. Yes. And how would one reconcile with uh, yeah. such? Yeah, well, you know, uh, you, one should not become negligent or indifferent towards duties and responsibilities of everyday realities of life. Even in the midst of doing your duties, performing your responsibilities, oh. facing the realities of life, one should uh, within the mind, one should develop a mechanism within mm -hmm. that guides you through all these difficulties. Well, I'm doing my best. You are got a wonderful job. If it is still you, within your mind, you should remember it is not going to last for long. In the sense, it is something related to this world. It may last only so long. Maybe for hundred years, we are going to live for hundred years. So that point should be kept in mind. So the idea of the imp impermanence of all these things, success, and also failure. Frequently we believe, mm -hmm. oh, this problem is going to be there all the time. In fact, very often we feel lost. People feel a kind of inner discontentment or unhappiness because they forget the fact that failure also is impermanent as success is impermanent. So that's one important thing. In, there, there is always a conflict between our mind and intellect. When you, you may be teaching psychology, you may be a specialist in behavioral science, but still you may be an eccentric in human behavior. It could happen. So the theories we know, what we teach, what we write about, we know at an intellectual level. But mind is at a different level. There is a, always this perpetual conflict between mind and intellect. And we all live at the mental level. We all live at the level of attitudes, emotions, feelings, not at the thought level. Mm -hmm. Go to a library, read a book, you are impressed. To come back to your home, you are not, you are in a different level. That's a level of mind, emotions, feelings, etc. And so long as there is a gap between these two, this problem is there. So very often what we intellectually understand, we are not able to remember when we live at the emotional level. So intellectually we should be able to understand that failure also is impermanent, not less than success. That's why Sri Ramakrishna puts in a very simple language. No? This higher wisdom you tie in your dhoti, if you are wearing not dhoti but pants, or, so put in your pocket and live in the world. That's what Sri Ramakrishna says. Mm -hmm. You cannot display in your hands. You would work with both hands. But whenever, whenever we face a, in a problem, then we can refer to this idea, higher idea. So, the gap between intellect and mind should be narrowed and that's possible by constantly associating with these ideas. If you can't associate with people who live these ideas, at least you can read their books, ideas, thoughts, but somehow we must keep also linked to this higher idea even in the midst of doing our duties and responsibilities with great efficiency, concentration and focus. Mm. We should not be negligent or indifferent. Uh, uh, even in the midst of uh, living in a very competitive society, 
with all enthusiasm and efficiency, we must keep in mind the fact which we all know intellectually, but we forget by living in this world. We should stop forgetting this fact that with these things are not going to be permanent. But very often, we may be happy to re remember the impermanence of the failure, but we may not always remember the impermanence of success. So we look for success all the time. This really doesn't happen. Impossible. No one can always succeed. The person who looks for success everywhere, in everything, is condemned to live in a world of dissatisfaction. Because success everywhere, all the time, is a very utopian idea. So we must remember uh, the impermanence of failure and also success. That gives you a tremendous uh, mental strength because very often worries and concerns and problems and anxieties take away a lot of mental health. We get fatigued. As I said, you know, you may be sitting in a car, not working hard, but you will curse the traffic system, the freeway system, the highway system. Oh, I'm going to be late today. But that doesn't help you to push forward. Feeling, I mean, observing your anxieties and problems, the, the, man, the driver in front of you is not going to move away. But then, knowing this fully well, we, fit, we become anxious, we become tired, exhausted and fatigued. Any intelligent person can understand this, but in actual life, we forget. That's again, you know, the gap between where intellect stands, where mind remains. That's the main problem. Often this conflict. In fact, in modern, in this 21st century, most people know many of these things. That makes it all the more difficult to solve the problem. <laughs> most of us know intellectually. We all know intellectually. But we are not able to remember this. We are not able to uh, practice the wisdom of this knowledge in actual life. The reason is, mind is at a much lower level. If we could always remember what we know and practice what we know, then there will be no problem in this world. So the natural tendency of the human mind to come down to the level of emotions and feelings and to move away from the level of what we know and come down to the level of what we are forced to do. So there's a gap between what we want to do and what we end up doing, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So. so Mara, that's a very profound thought what you say. It would take a time to absorb what you just say. Uh -huh. <coughs> The one question I have is that, let's say, individual level, I become successful, I have resources to make myself comfortable, family comfortable and all that. But all well I know, how many papers are left behind, how many suffering are there, how many places are, you know, things like that. And it's just not about that stays as a constant guilty sometimes for, for, for me that why I cannot do more or anything like that. Even let's say I become whatever resource I, I donate, but that still doesn't solve. How do you, how can one can, like you know, do not st avoid that guilty or what? what's the best thing to do so you, you are not guilty but you are doing something? Well, at the subjective level, we must, we can try to do our, our duty, our responsibility, the best of our level. Can you repeat the questions so the people uh, downstairs okay. with here? Even please one small In a simple words. Right. The, like you know, making oneself comfortable and resourceful and successful, but there's so many people are left behind. And once someone knows that, what can you do? So you are not just guilt of it, but you are doing something. Oh, you mean when you, you are trying to improve your lot? But there are many who are, who, who, who are still... In fact, if 
you are in Jesus Christ and Buddha, you can have the luxury of worrying about the whole humanity. Eight billion people inhabiting this planet Earth. So, if a day also did not succeed in bringing happiness to the entire humanity for all times. So what we can do is do our best. Uh, if you can help your immediate friends, relatives, colleagues, in whatever way possible, that itself is enough for you. We need not worry about the whole humanity. Uh, actually, uh, if we worry about the whole humanity, very often it could be, you know, it could be a play of the human mind. When we really do not want to do something in a big way, then our mind is trying to find a justification for doing anything. Well, either I shall do that and benefit the entire 8 billion people inhabiting this planet Earth, or I will do nothing. So very often, you know, when we are not willing to do anything good, then a part of our mind detaches itself in the main body and creates a false imaginary justification for, no, for not doing anything worthwhile. Instead of that, whatever little we can do, in terms of words, deeds, and if that gives us peace of mind, inner fulfillment, and also if it benefits, if it benefits others, that itself is a matter of joy. That's all we can do. Worrying about the whole humanity is uh, absolutely unnecessary for us, spiritual seekers. To be selfish, I mean, to be self-oriented in a narrow sense, self in the, in the, our own, interested in only our own physical comforts, material comforts, is bad. Not doing anything because it doesn't benefit the entire humanity is also bad. So what we can do, Whatever we can do for our good will be eventually good for those who are dependent upon you, family, friends, colleagues and acquaintances. So that will be doing a lot of good for others. That's the best thing to do. Right. Swamiji, uh, you mentioned that uh, you perform user Purushartha for Dharma Thakamoha. Yeah. And modern science, motivational sciences tell us to bring out the best potential in yourself. Keep striving for it. If I accept contentment, do I run the risk of being complacent and not bring out the potential in myself? Okay. The, the question is, we have Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. These are humans. The, and this is the scope of human life, four fundamental values. And modern science and the modern world tells us that we must bring out the best uh, in us. So if we remain contented, uh, that will be an obstacle to bringing, in bringing the best in us. In a way, contentment is not, uh, not the contentment coming out of inaction, laziness or indifference. The greatest and the most uh, successful teachers of the world had this tremendous inner contentment, but they didn't keep quiet. They worked for others. Con you can never be in a state of contentment if you are not constantly doing your best to bring up best witness. Second point is, the highest contentment comes when you go on struggling to bring to bring up to bring out the best spiritual uh, treasure that is within you. So, contentment is not the satisfaction of a person who doesn't do anything. It is not a it is not a stumbling block in our progress. Rather, it helps you. To preserve your energy, conserve your energy, ability to concentrate, so that you will be able to do more. You will be able to succeed better. You will be able to bring out the best in you. So that's why I made the statement earlier. 
in fact these four purusharthas themselves is a scheme for bringing out the best in us through contentment see dharma and moksha these are the basic values artha and kama i should explain in english dharma is righteousness you know uh, let us say uh, what preserves human life e dharma dharite iti dharma dhadhadu mean that preserves that bears that protects the sustains that is dharma now moksha is liberation the highest transcendental value now if we if we pursue the path of artha and kama means enjoyment comforts and the means for enjoy more and more enjoyment and comforts if we pursue this path without uh, following the path of dharma righteousness then what happens we will not reach the level of moksha liberation or transcendental value rather we will get hooked into artha and kama to give an example if a person goes on working hard to make more and more money and wealth and he forgets the principles of dharma he may think money and wealth will give him everything and you can imagine what happens discontentment fatigue anxiety depression this is what happens if a person if anybody forgets the importance of dharma and all the time working hard of the greed for acquiring more and more artha more and more joy more and more happiness he is he is heading towards psychological disaster and total failure in life so our vedic sages made this scheme very clear you can work hard and you should work hard for acquiring the necessary tools for enjoying this world make money get try to get higher job try to get the highest grade in the university uh, but then don't play false games don't deviate from the path of dharma righteousness this spiritual discipline keeping yourself within this jurisdiction of dharma do your best try to be successful whether you business may make profit but then don't forget the principles of dharma see vedanta is very realistic in fact there is a statement in the smriti a householder who doesn't work hard who does not work hard to make money wealth and everything for the good of his his family his friends and his society and his country but without forgetting the principles of dharma that means holding fast to the principles of dharma if a householder doesn't do that if he forgets if he is negligent in making wealth to dharmic means he is na dharmi he is a sinner smrtis are very very realistic see vedanta is not a philosophy of life negating over asceticism totally wrong vedic literature gives a very comprehensive holistic scheme of life people should work hard <coughs> this bhutena pramadi dabhyam one in the convocation understand that the upanishad bhutena pramadi dabhyam so there is a there is a convocation address in the taitriya upanishad veda marmuchi acharya handeva sarvam shastri satyam vada dharma chari fine but another instruction is the household should constantly work hard to make wealth how through dharmic means without deviating from the principles of dharma and he should do his best uh, to bring out the best in him now and then you know at that stage when he sticks to the principles of dharma even while pursuing this secular empirical path of life at one stage he will realize the impermanence of this physical comforts and then he will think of moksha you know i tell you one important i can give an example if you don't mind you find in this country 
a lot of people very successful in professional life, academic life, business life. Sometimes they take a lot of interest in spiritual values. There is a logical explanation for this. A good number of them have realized the impermanence of secular empirical joy. I mean, the worldly pressures. Of course, they forget that lesson, of course, when that happens, of course. But then, at one stage, people realize the impermanence of worldly enjoyments. And then they think of the higher transcendental value. It doesn't mean that you should, uh, you should be neck deep in secular worldly pressures to be able to understand the importance of transcendental value. No, it doesn't mean that. But very often you find people who have everything going in their favor thinking of higher things. Why this happens? Because they follow certain uh, values like dharma, <coughs> the pursuit of artha and karma, I mean worldly person. So they, they realize that the fate forces them to realize the impermanence of these things. So, please remember, Contentment doesn't block your path to higher success. Rather, it helps you to bring out the best in you. Contentment conserves your energy, saves your energy. So you'll be able to work hard all the more better. In fact, there is a verse in Gita, Saktaha karmani avidyam so yadha kurvanti bharada it's a very great statement. It's, it's a description of karma yoga. Anyway, the point is, these are two types of people. The ignorant people who don't follow the principles of dharma, who are, and who are eager or obsessed with, with the results of what they are doing, who want to enjoy the best of worldly comforts who don't practice the path of yoga or anything, who don't care for Vedantic principles, who just uh, neck deep in the in worldly pressures. This is one time. They work very hard. They work 15 hours a day. They are very efficient. They are very professional, very successful. But at, at, at every day they have to take five pills for getting four hours sleep. Anxiety, neurosis, depression, suicidal symptoms, and all these problems. But they are very successful. Finally, they, are, they can't eat any, anything because all the money they put in the bank is accumulated. They cannot make any use of it. So by the time they, by the, at the end of the day, they become psychologically incapable of enjoying the wealth they have produced, they have created. This is the picture of the man of this world, the workaholic, successful businessman, not interested in spiritual matters, neck deep in worldly pleasures. And then there is another picture. That's what we have to think of. A man of wisdom. So kuriya vidwan tatha asaktaka. Vidwan means a person of spiritual wisdom. An enlightened person. What does he do? He works with the same level of efficiency, maybe higher level of efficiency, with greater enthusiasm, much more professional, much more successful. Asatta. Why? But you know, he understands the impermanence of worldly pressures. But he's working. He doesn't go run away in the forest and stay there. No. He's also working. He may be more successful, more professional, more efficient, but at the same time, he is asakta. He is totally non attached. So, vidwan asakta. Saktaha karmani avidwam so etha kurvanti bharata. Karmani avidwam saka karmani sakta. These people, ignorant people who don't care for high spiritual values, they are obsessed. They are attached with worldly pressures, sattva. But they work very hard, but physical health, mental health, spiritual health, all gone. The other picture, vidwan, 
man of knowledge, wisdom. Asatta is not, not attached. So what happens? He is also successful. He is also efficient, maybe more efficient, more successful, but he is detached. So he is not affected by these worldly pleasures. So remember, contentment doesn't make you a failure in worldly life. It helps you to succeed better, in fact. But it saves you from the problems of success. The problems of success are much more terrible to solve. See, you can find this. If, if, you, are, if you are poor, you can, uh, you can uh, divert all your efficiency, all your professionalism towards wealth, make, towards a job which makes you wealth. So there is a way to divert. Suppose you are successful, plenty of everything, and you are totally unhappy, what will you do? Then you have to realize the impermanence of your success. That realization gives you this higher contentment. So contentment far from blocking your path in life to success. That uh, helps you to succeed, but uh, helps you also to avoid the problems of success. What are the problems of success? Anxiety, neurosis, depression, melancholia, and suicide. That's all. That's it. Description they <laughs> That's why, you know, in fact, there are some countries, like Japan, for example, is a classic example, is a perfectionist society. Everything is fine. Uh, the suicide rate is very high, melancholy problems. And some of the Scandinavian countries, highly successful, welfare state system, you know, much more. There, you get the best of Medicare for maybe one-tenth of what it costs here in this country. Everything is fine, but anxiety, neurosis, depression, melancholy, suicide are also very high. <laughs> so what's the use of it? That's the idea. So contentment helps you to, to succeed without facing the problems of success. That's the idea. So we have five minutes more perhaps, I think. One, um, <coughs> one question. So you said uh, rebirth helps in uh, being content that I'm growing a spiritual bank so the next life I will be picking up, picking it up from here. Yeah. So that gives me satisfaction that you know whatever I do is like a relay race. Yeah. But uh, on the empirical this thing, on the secular this thing, how does that help in uh, you know that I'm going to come in the next birth, birth after birth. So how does that help in uh, contentment? Yeah. In a you know, in a worldly yeah. sense, yeah. 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 in a law of karma and rebirth, uh, great advantage. So some disadvantages. You know, one point is, it could, uh, it could, when not properly interpreted, lead to some misunderstandings. For example, you know, this complacency, procrastination, uh, indifference towards the problems of the present. These are some of the inherent problems when uh, this is interpreted as a kind of fatalism, predeterminism. It is not predeterminism or fatalism. Now, coming back to subject, you know, in fact, uh, the idea that uh, you are heading towards hell is a problem in especially in Calvinism, you know, in Calvinist the theology, you are predetermined. Uh, you, are, you, you, are, you are predetermined either to go to hell or heaven. Confession, you don't accept. In the Calvinist theology, which is school of branch of the Lutheran, I mean the Protestant tradition. So many people whom I have to face during interviews and appointments, they talk about this problem of going to hell because they could not do any spiritual practice in this life. So they are heading to hellfire. In fact, very enlightened, educated people who are otherwise very enlightened, old people especially, because they are tutored in these doctrines right from the early days. They face this problem. Now, you can easily imagine. Uh, if, and also not only that, 
it's uh, sometimes it kills your initiate you to start a new chapter in your life now. Vedanta tells you, you can start a new chapter, turn a new life in the book of your life right now, in this moment. Predeterminism kills that initiative. It blocks that path. So, uh, the, the doctrine of rebirth and of karma tells you that you need not worry about the past. If you couldn't uh, undertake any spiritual practices in the past, you didn't worry about it. One could start any day, any moment. Because you can start a new chapter in your life anytime. Because this life is not only chance given to you. And whatever little you are doing now will not be lost. It also will help you. It will help you to continue your spiritual journey in the next life. That is a great message of uh, Vedanta. So it gives you tremendous self-confidence. That's the thing. You know. In fact, when the great thinkers of the 19th century, like Schopenhauer, uh, Paul Dewison, who is a leading dorologist who translated Upanishads into uh, German directly from Sanskrit. Made what, uh, what impressed them, what uh, uh, impressed them very strongly was this, uh, this great philosophical doctrine. It liberates you from the tyranny of, uh, a, I mean, certain belief and the prison walls of predeterminism. Pre and you're permanently heading to a scale fire and things like that. Any time, any moment, you can start a new life. That's what Lord Krishna says here. Kasti Durgadin Namutra Kasti Durgadin So Lord Krishna answers Arjuna's question. I listen to you, Vedu, Yog, Siddhamana Saha. A proper yoga samsi dim kam kidding Krishna gets. The answer is this. Look here, Krishna addresses Arjuna with great compassion. Tata explains. See, whatever you do will not be lost in this life or the next. Because a person who does the slightest amount of good, it may be in the form of an action, an act of kindness and compassion to others or maybe a little effort on your part to improve your own spiritual lot will not be wasted. That's the meaning. So that's a great, uh, it's a great word of encouragement and a great promise. Actually. One, one reason why the, uh, there was a lot of enthusiastic welcome, enthusiastic res I mean, response to Vedantic message was this this, li this uh, liberation from the tyranny of predeterminism and so the, the idea of being content perpetually helpful. This idea. If you will, if you couldn't lead a spiritual life till now, start right now, this moment. In fact, when you listen to this idea, that's also spiritual practice. Sravanam, Maranam, Nidhyasana, even, even listening. People may think spirituality means you must do some ritual, some elaborate, some... No. Even when you listen to a great spiritual idea, what is happening, you know, you are accumulating uh, some skara. When you listen, when we listen to these ideas, uh, your mind accumulates a samskara, an impression, a spiritual culture, and it enriches our life, our mind. And if we listen to these ideas with great, great attention, then uh, maybe after 10 years, you may forget everything, after 10 years we come across a book on these subjects in a university or library, suddenly this help you, this will help to connect with that. So that is the unique message of the time. So, it doesn't mean that we should become complacent or negligent. No. It's a great word of compassion, a great word of promise. 
That's the uniqueness of Vedanta. It doesn't mean that we should, uh, you know, we should, uh, uh, we should not be enthusiastic that we can afford to be complacent. No, it doesn't encourage or promote complacency. But uh, it gives a, a antidote to this problem of anxiety and feel a, a feeling of being completely lost. That's the way. So I thank you for the questions. We'll continue the discussion maybe tomorrow. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Dhar Sat Sri Ram Krishna Namaste